Let's begin our seminar. Um, dear participants, uh, thank you for your interest in this seminar and we're starting. All right, well, uh, good evening for those of you in Kazakhstan. Uh, my name is Dr. Mark Waltz and I'm here with uh, Jason Nesbitt. Uh, from the USJ's Agricultural Research Center in Reno, Nevada. Today is the second in a series of five presentations that we have put together with our partners uh, at FAO and Michigan State University. Today we're going to be focusing on rangeland monitoring and assessment techniques that are used in the United States and across the world. Uh, this is a brief outline then of how we're going to go through the uh, seminar today. There will be a couple of places where we stop for questions as we change from one detailed subject matter to another to make sure that everyone understands where we are because as we go through this process, we keep building on the information. So important to uh, understand each section. So at the end, then we can talk about assessing rangelands. Rangeland monitoring assessment. Why are we doing it? That's the central question. What information do you need to know? What are the resource concerns and why are you monitoring? We've come up with an acronym in the Natural Resources Conservation Service and they call it SWAPA plus H. It stands for soil, water, air, plant, animal. Those are all environmental concerns. We also have human concerns. That's the plus H. That deals with the economics, social, and legal constraints that we want to address. What are research con concerns? Soils could be that you have advanced soil erosion. What is the health and condition of the soil? Have you lost all your organic matter? What is the structure of the soil? Has it been trampled and now is a massive structure? Is it crusted? Water, quality, quantity, availability, air. We have gaseous emissions uh, from livestock operations. Plants, is the area dominated by invasive weeds? What is our potential for carbon sequestration and reducing the impact of livestock production? What is the forage quality and abundance? From an animal's perspective, there are things related to forage balance, health and condition of the animal, wildlife habitat. Do we need winter supplement? How are the facilities for handling the animal? This training then develops skills through the classroom uh, and hopefully we'll be there in November where we can do some online field experiences. We first did a abbreviated course for two days back in 2019 and the center slide shows the participants that attended that session. The first process in doing an assessment then is to collect all available data. What information do you need? Soils, plant communities, climate, topography, and historic use of the land. Has it been grazed? Was it recently burned? Has there been a large insect outbreak that has uh, removed vegetation or maybe killed plants? You can go directly to the source or people who know the resource in the history of the site. Uh, the rancher or the herder may actually be a good source of information on how the property has historically been used. Compare your answers from different sources. Get peer review uh, if possible and cross-reference your sources of information. Also the literature, uh, even in Kazakhstan, has some outstanding papers then that document the climate. Uh, there's FAO soils. There are plant community distribution maps in the Atlas of Kazakhstan, which is a wonderful review document 
So there are a lot of resources you can gather then to try and understand the place that you're working at. An example is this. Uh, it's a distribution of precipitation for the entire country of Kazakhstan. Yakmola Oblast is roughly three to 400 millimeters of precipitation zone. Fairly evenly distributed with slightly higher amounts in the summer. Vegetation distribution by land use classification. So there are maps that are available that can be downloaded from the internet if you have GIS capabilities. Uh, and you can map out then using different <clears throat> strategies uh, that have been deployed. Uh, this one breaks them up in fairly gross categories of grasslands versus savannas, croplands, needle forest, broadleaf and mixed forest, water bodies, and wetlands. You can look at uh, try and getting resources, the Ministry of Agriculture uh, on above ground net primary productivity. Uh, this is a map that we developed from this project, looking at stability from 2001 to 2014. And so we created a key uh, where purple uh, has the sparsest vegetation and therefore has the lowest livestock carrying capacity. The dark green has the highest uh, stable <laughs> uh, Please mute your mics, uh, you're coming through. Uh, we also then looked at calculating a coefficient of variation. How much change occurred at a particular site over time? What we found was that there's as much as 40% variation between the lowest year of production and the highest year of production. And that was prim primarily driven by precipitation. This is critical to understand how much variation we have in setting our stocking rates. If we set it for average conditions, then during drought years, we are gonna overgraze the pasture and stress the plant community. Droughts are fairly frequent in Central Asia and they may last for as long as five years. On the other end of drought, we have some very severe spring weather. I believe it's called die hots, where you have vegetation that is greened up in the spring and then you have a sudden extreme blizzard comes in and it kills the vegetation. Both do occur in Kazakhstan. Droughts are more frequent. So as we move through this lecture series over the next five weeks, we will calculate in a drought coefficient to buffer us on those years with below average production resulting from lower precipitation. This should allow for stable livestock production. We're gonna start with the foundation used here in the United States, and that's called an ecological site. All of our management decisions then are based on this concept of an ecological site. It is a distinctive type of land based on reoccurring landforms with distinct soils, kinds and amount of vegetation, similarity in hydrology, geology, climate characteristics, and its resistance and resilience to stresses. Physical characteristics, distinguishing physi physiographic things like climate, soils, hydrologic features of the ecological site, including variability. Vegetation dynamics, the state and transition model. That is the heart of an ecological site is that development of a state and transition models. These are the different pathways that one plant community can move as it degrades to a second one, maybe a third one, and eventually it can cross a threshold and cannot return to the desired plant community. We'll go over that in much more detail in this presentation. 
interpretations of ecosystem services provided by the site and the state. We're currently focusing on grazing, but sometimes the site might want to be primarily used for wildlife, and these can be expanded and incorporated into an ecological site. Supporting data then provides the information we need to derive the state in transition model. This is an example here uh, using a 3D model uh, from the Southern United States, where we look at different types of soils that are derived from the landform. So you can see one area that's talking about gravel that's in the dark blue up there in the upper right-hand side. We have other areas in this landform, this landscape that are highly sandy. They have severe risk for wind erosion. So stocking rates have to be very carefully measured there so we don't create large interconnected bare spaces that allow then the wind to accelerate its speed and then actually move the soil. We have other areas because of the parent material uh, in the geologic formation that when they weather become very clay and those provide a dominant by grasses in this area in the United States. Up in the limestone hills, you can also see that the grass is protected. They're very steep areas and it's difficult for livestock to get there. So they are kind of a reserve area. Ecological site concepts. It starts with the soils. In the United States, we have tried to map all of our soils across the United States. We're down to maybe four or 5% of the United States that haven't been mapped originally. And soil surveys have different classifications. A class one is a very, very detailed site-specific soil survey. And that might be most associated with if you're gonna do a construction project on that site. So you wanna know uh, the stability of the soil. In rangelands, we often do a broad survey which we call a class three survey. And so we don't physically go out there and measure soils by digging soil pits everywhere across the landscape. Rangelands are just too large and it's too costly. So we use uh, photogrammetry uh, and then correlations between those few areas that we do sample and describe the soil and map the vegetation and then through mapping the vegetation, we make inferences on the soil. And then after we've done that, we go out there and test the sites to make sure if our correlation is accurate. In the reference materials today that I have provided to Golnaz and Cosno, our partner, are the USDA handbooks on how to do soil surveys. By stratifying the landscape based on ecological potential, ecological sites depict the distinctive kinds and amount of vegetation in relationship to the soils. So as you see in this photo, in the left-hand side, there's a photograph of the soil. It is uniquely different than the one on the right-hand side. And because of the differences in soils, then we will get differences in vegetation. Concept of an ecological site. Like I said, the first thing we want to do is dig a soil pit. When we're doing an assessment for livestock grazing, we typically will only dig down to 50 centimeters. In a soil survey, you would dig down to a meter or to bedrock. But for the, but for the sake of time and expediency, when we're doing site assessments, we'll dig a pit to 50 centimeters. We then break the soil up into what we call horizons. Those are unique areas of the soil that may have differences in soil texture. They may have differences in soil chemistry. Uh, they may have differences in the aggregate size. Those are all defined in the handbooks that I've provided as supplemental material. They will also have differences and water holding potential. Uh, and that's very critical then in understanding which plant materials can grow on the site. 
Here in a loamy soil, uh, these are typically what we would call mollusols in the United States. These are historically formed under grasslands. And this is a very common type of soil that we found in Kazakhstan. They have high water holding capacities. Uh, they may be lower in the uh, landform, so you get runoff, and they may be susceptible to erosion and compaction by livestock action or wheel traffic by driving over them. They have moderately high uh, production potential for grasses. Sandy soils, uh, we saw those down in southern uh, Kazakhstan. They have high water infiltration rate because of the sand, but they are very susceptible to wind erosion. The sand does not hold as much water uh, near the surface because it penetrates through to the deeper horizons. So they have moderate production of grasses. Step two, we want to look at the land form and the landscape. So we look at the slope and the aspect of the site, and we look at the soil texture by depth. The other thing that we're going to be looking for is depth to water table. And that's a relative thing. If the water table is down at 100 meters, uh, we're not too interested in that because that's below the depth of most plants. But if you have shallow water tables that are up above one meter, then that can influence the type of plants that will grow there. And there are many wetland areas or sub-irrigated areas that we saw in the Akmola obelisk. And so it is important then when you're out there to understand where is your water table in relationships to the plants that you have there. <coughs> and soil chemistry. Uh, here in the United States, uh, we end up with gypic soils, sodium soils, sometimes salt affected soils, what we would call natric soils. Are you near a river course that could cause flooding? And if so, what is the duration that that plant community will be inundated with water? What is the overall depth of the soil? And most importantly, is there a restricting layer in the soil that will prevent roots from penetrating? It could be petrocalcic horizons. That's a chemical formation in the soil uh, that'll seal it off and the roots can't penetrate it. Could be a durapan or a fragipan. The soil terms then are defined in more detail and how to recognize them in the reference material that I provided uh, that you can look at after the course. So we get back to now, what is our reference that we're interested in? What we try and do is identify that upper right-hand corner, that idealized plant community that has the complete matrix of desired plants that we anticipate to find there. We can usually find that in an area, let's say maybe like a national park where there's been limited grazing it could be a corner of a pasture that because a gully cuts through it has been isolated and hasn't been grazed. You can see in the center photo, a fence line contrast. The site on the left has been recently heavily grazed. You can tell that by the height of the vegetation, you can see more, more bare soil than on the right-hand side. The left-hand picture up in the top corner is a site that has been degraded and we're starting to see now a loss of the vegetation in the grass species. And we see much more of the wormwood or the artemisia. So our reference then in Kazakhstan, <clears throat> they're in Akmola, which has these large grassland stub areas in continuous formation is gonna be kind of that center picture uh, that we were talking with uh, colleagues when we visited a few years ago. So the reference condition is based on what is possible for a particular soil and climate combination given its natural disturbance. If fire is natural in your community, then that needs to be recognized. A state and transition model 
indicates what is realistic based on short-term potential and the limited resources available within the plant community. Knowing what possible prov provides a consistent standard for inventory, assessment, and monitoring. You have to know what your baseline is, your background that you're measuring against, or you really can't establish trends and uh, directional shifts. So in the graphic, I have illustrated a common problem here that I live with in Reno, Nevada. Upper left-hand photo, it's called a sagebrush step. That is an artemisia uh, shrub, a uh, different species than what you have in Kazakhstan with grass in the inner space. That is the historic plant community. With excessive grazing, we can then get an invasion of pinion trees and juniper trees, as indicated in the picture slightly to the right, where it says invasion. Those then, because of excess water use, will dry out the site, the shrubs will disappear, the grass will disappear. During our droughts then, these trees become extremely vulnerable to fire and we can have catastrophic wildfires as indicated if you follow the arrow to the right. Once that wildfire has occurred, then we have an invasive annual grass that comes from Eurasia. We call it cheatgrass. It's Bromus tectorum that can take over and dominate the site. It has an early fall germination, it then winters, and in the spring, it accelerates its growth, uh, utilizing all the water and nutrients before the long-term perennial plants can reestablish. This then sets up a very fine fuel load, which is highly flammable. Fires then go from about a 60-year return period to three to five years. That cycle continues two or three times by the time you've had the third cheatgrass fire on your site, you are then setting yourself up to cross a threshold because there are no seeds in the soil from your historic plants. The site has eroded uh, as indicated in the lower right-hand side. And then if you look on the left-hand side, it's dominated by this uh, invasive annual grass. It's only utilizable by livestock very early in the spring for about three or four weeks, then it dries out. So we have lost tremendous amount of our grazing capacity when this sets up. So if we have situations like this or similar to this in Kazakhstan, we really want to understand what the consequences are so that when we're monitoring and designing management, we can try and break this cycle and prevent it from crossing the threshold. Right now in the United States, we do not know how to return a site that has been dominated by the annual grass, cheatgrass, back to the shrub dominated steppe community. It's an active research topic. Based on our experience in Akmola, then we have defined this prototypic state and transition model for the grassland steppe areas that we were working in. Starts up there on the top, where it says Roman numeral one. It is a stipa with diverse perennial grasses with some festucas and others. It has the, the shrub artemisia in it, wormwood, and a nice mixture of perennial and annual forbs. With grazing, it can then go to site three. You drop straight down you start to lose the stipas and it becomes more of a festuca site. If the area is not grazed at all and put in like a reserve, then it can shift in, to number two, where you have plant decadence, excess litter, and you actually lose some productive capability of the site. If you're in state three, that festuca, stipa, artemisia, complex. You still have good grazing potential, uh, but the festuca is just not as palatable as the stipa. But continued excess grazing will then drive you over to number four, that degraded state where it becomes festuca 
and the artemisia. Continued overgrazing ends up in that severely degraded state that's dominated by our artemisia, and that's about it from what we've seen. So we believe, or we are proposing, that there's a threshold there. Once you get to that site that is being dominated by artemisia, the fundamental question is, is can we restore it back to state one? What are the techniques that we would have to implement to get it back there? I don't believe that grazing alone or stopping grazing will bring it back. And one of the reasons for that is, is we've lost the original seed source of the stipas and the festucas that we want in our plant community. So we may have to do an intervention of some type of seeding. This can be easily tested by taking the soil in the severely degraded state, state five, in the top one to two centimeters, and then placing that soil, sieving it, so it's down to going through a number 10 or a two millimeter sieve, placing it in some Petri dishes, lightly watering it and seeing what germinates and then counting the different types of species that emerge. And that is a way of documenting that we've lost the seed source for natural regeneration and we will have to use an intervention. Uh, typically that would be seeding. The nice soils in Kazakhstan would lend themselves to uh, using a rangeland drill uh, as indicated in that small inset picture on the left-hand side. We have seen pastures in Akmola that have been uh, seeded with a native grass over there, crested wheatgrass, Agripyrum desertorum, uh, and that can have very good production potential and they are resistant to grazing. So a site consists of one or more communities including their soils that occur in a particular ecological site. So not everything has to be identical. You will have small changes in soils, maybe based on aspect or based on elevation. And so you'll have slight shifts in your plant community. Uh, that diversity we try and capture into a single ecological site. States are distinguished by major changes in the plant functional groups, as I just described. You can change the soil properties. If you've had ex excessive wind erosion, then you can lose the A horizon. You can also have deposition from excess wind erosion or water erosion. And our ecosystem process is functioning. Uh, how is your degradation of your litter, the decomposition moving? Do you see old stagnant litter? that is gray and is just very slowly decaying and you don't see any organic matter, dark uh, litter incorporated into the soil. A common consequence of a state change is differences in the biodiversity, as we said, the vegetation structure and density, uh, management requirements. You have to haul more water more frequently. You have to provide supplemental forage because there's not enough for them to eat. Have you altered the forage availability for the livestock? Invasive weeds are now seen uh, in the area. These can both be poisonous plants or non-poisonous. You start to see rills that we talked about last week forming. Uh, you see bare ground in larger connected areas. Those are all indications that you've changed the state. So again, like last week, everything is measured against this reference state. So that's one of the first things we need to do is go out there and identify this idealized plant community and we measure against it in change. Last week, we did that qualitatively. This week, we're gonna systematically go through and show you how to measure it quantitatively. And then over time, if you repeat this technology once a year on the site, then you'll be able to track your trends and see if you're moving towards your desired plant community or away from it.
Transitions and pathways. A transition is a shift between states. They're not always reversible, as we saw earlier, uh, I have been describing that. Thresholds, that's a conceptual one-way barrier. As I indicated in our provisional ecological site description and the state and transition model, we drew a line and we said, once we start to see a significant dominance of the site by the Artemisia wormwood, we believe we've crossed the threshold, which is very, very difficult and may not be possible to cross back without human intervention. Pathways, that's the connections between the communities and the state. You can have reversible shifts in pathways, as we saw in the provisional, between one and two and three and one. You can even have some shifting between uh, the pathways between four and five. So the summary then for state and transition model, ecological sites are based on state and transition. That's the concept we've been talking about of what is the plant community's distribution of plants? And then does it move to an alternative state because of pressure? Most of the pressure we're talking about here is through livestock grazing. Maybe even changing the type of livestock if you move from cattle to goats and sheep because they graze different forage types, then that is one management option that might bring a site back. Ecological site applications to conservation planning and implementation. So ecological states are our foundation. So when we're on a ranch for the first time, we wanna identify what the ecological site is. And in the United States, we basically have the concept that an ecological site can have multiple soils types underneath it. But a soil can only be, soil series as we define them in the United States can only be associated with one ecological site. So ecological site application to conservation planning and implementation, individual land managers examine the probabilities, the cost, and the benefits, and the time frames from moving from one state to the next. I'm gonna show you now a quick video and hopefully then we can hear uh, the sounds. All of the videos today and additional ones are in the supplemental material so that you can review them at leisure after the class. So ecological site identification is probably one of the most important steps in any inventory, assessment, or monitoring project, no matter what type of land you're working on. It's an important process because it allows us to establish what the ecological potential of a particular piece of land is. What's possible for that piece of land, what's not possible, and what's likely to require significant inputs in order to generate particular changes that we're looking for on a landscape. Obviously, we're going to need other pieces of information in addition to the ecological site identification to make those determinations. Things like an ecological site description, state and transition models, other information that we have about the dynamics of that landscape. But the first step is always to determine where we are on that landscape and what the soils are. So the first thing we do when we get to a site is we start by looking around and figuring out where we are in this landscape. And as I look around here, I know we're in the Hornada Basin because I looked at a highway map before I got out here. And I also know that we are in the lower part of the basin. We've got mountains on both sides. I've got a good idea that those have probably been contributing some sediments. And in this particular case, I happened to talk with an expert at the university, Dr. Curtis Monger, 
who informed me that this is also an area that has received a lot of aeolian deposition. In other words, there have been an awful lot of windblown sediments that have ended up on this basin. So I was guessing, based on that and the soil map, although the soil map is not of particularly good quality, but I was guessing that I would probably be on some fairly coarse sandy soils in this particular part of the basin. And in fact, as I look around, it does look like the soils are fairly coarse and sandy. The next thing that I need to do now is define the area that I'm actually going to be working in. Define the area that I'm going to set up as my monitoring point or as my assessment. And again, looking around, I'm looking for a fairly relatively uniform area that I'm going to use for that. And I'm going to go out maybe 50 yards or so. And I'm actually going to walk through this area and look for any particular parts of it that seem to be somewhat unusual in terms of the microtopography, in other words, the slope of that, that, or in terms of some of the soil surface characteristics. So I'm going to walk out here a little bit to this, this bare area behind me and take a look at that. So I've walked out here, I've only walked about 10 yards, and suddenly I'm in a completely different area of vegetation cover. Where I was standing before, a lot of grass, probably 50, 60. Now, that's, that's a really different set of vegetation in each of these three areas, and they're only about 10, 15 yards apart. Am I in a different ecological site? Well, I won't know until I dig the hole. But looking at the soil surface, it all looks pretty sandy. This looks like we're a little bit lower in here, maybe a little bit more clay in the, in the soil, a little bit more crusting. But basically, the soil surface looks pretty similar. So the next thing that I'm going to have to do is to dig a hole in each of these areas and determine which ecological site I'm actually on. So now we've walked around the site, this particular area that we started out in, it turns out looks fairly representative of, of much of the site, and that's where I'm going to go ahead and dig my first hole. And when I dig my hole, I'm going to be using this hole a lot of times, not just to determine what the soil and ecological site is, but also to perhaps look at some indicators later on, like compaction, um, soil organic matter, and so forth. So I'm going to dig it in, a, in an area that's not only representative of the soils, but also representative of the vegetation. I think this area right here where I've got kind of a bare patch, um, but also some vegetation surrounding it, is actually pretty typical of this particular site. So I'm going to start digging my hole right here. I want to make it so that uh, the face of the hole, the face of the pit, is facing the sun so that uh, I can see it pretty well. And uh, you don't have to dig a very big hole. In fact, a lot of folks will actually use an auger. Uh, I find that uh, an auger is usually unnecessary, but it can make it easier, particularly have to dig a fairly deep hole. Now, I do happen to know for this area that the most critical thing are two. Number one is what's the soil texture, which we're going to do in a few minutes here. And the second is what is the depth of the soil? And, uh, in southern New Mexico, where we are right now, the key factor in determining whether we are in a sandy or a shallow sandy ecological site is whether the depth to what we call the petrocalcic horizon, it's a pretty hard, white, uh, kind of rocky layer. Okay, if it's at least 20 inches deep, that's going to make it a sandy ecological site. And if it's less than 20 inches deep, it will be a shallow sandy ecological site. And uh, I'm not feeling anything. It, it, it feels pretty sandy. But I'm not quite down to, to 20 inches. The other thing is I'm digging down. Again, I'm, I'm looking at other aspects of that soil profile. Am I getting any change in texture? Am I starting to pick up more clay? Uh, if it starts to get harder to dig, that's often a, a good sign that... Uh, we started to get into some more clay. And in this particular case, it seems to be fairly sandy straight down through the profile. So 
try that tape measure again. And I've gone down now uh, almost 22 inches, and there's no sign of a calcic horizon, or a petrocalcic horizon, rather. In other words, I haven't hit any rocks or anything. And uh, so I'm going to call that a, a sandy ecological site, except I haven't really confirmed the texture. It looks sandy to me, but I still want to pick up some of that soil near the surface. And I'm going to determine the soil texture. And uh, I know a lot of people, if you're not a soil scientist, have not had a soil science class, you say, oh, I can't do that. You the soil science do that. You don't. All you got to do, wet up some of the soil in your hand. And uh, see if you can make a ball out of it. And in this case, I've got it nice and moist, and uh, I can't even make a ball that won't crack. That's a pretty sandy soil, okay? If I've been able to make a ball out of it, the next step then is I try to make a ribbon out of it. Well, this won't make a ribbon at all. This is almost like a beach sand. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to want to do is just check at least one or two other areas within this, uh, one or two other pits within this site, and make sure that, that this is fairly uniform throughout the site, that, that this wasn't just an anomaly that I happened to hit this one particular location. Okay. When I walked around this area, I noticed that in addition to those relatively sandy and higher areas with or sites within this area, there were also some lower areas, maybe about a foot lower in elevation, but it appeared that they were somewhat finer textured. I noticed some, some physical and biological crust showing up in these in these slightly lower areas, a little more grass cover. And I thought, well, there's a possibility we maybe have a complex of two different ecological sites in here. So to test that, I went ahead, I dug another hole, grabbed the sample, did the soil texture, and what I found was, in fact, there is a little bit of variability here. This is a little bit finer textured soil, but it's still a loamy sand. Not quite as sandy as that other spot, but sandy enough to put it in the sandy ecological site. The other thing I found was that, again, this pit, I went down at least uh, 20 inches or 50 centimeters, and I did not encounter any sort of restrictive layer. I didn't encounter petrocalcic horizon. I didn't encounter any rock. And so based on those observations, I'm pretty comfortable saying that this entire area that we are planning to monitor is in the sandy ecological site. And we can treat it as being a relatively homogeneous area in terms of its potential. We'll take a quick set of questions right now. So have we explained the concept of an ecological site and how the, the foundation is uh, on soils? Are there any questions? Okay, uh, I'll go ahead and then continue on. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Можно будет вопрос? Да, please, please ask. Умбаев Абдирахман, Казахский аграрный, Национальный аграрный исследовательский университет Алмата. Я профессор, занимаюсь вопросом животноводства и занимался и пастбищным хозяйством. У нас 184 миллиона гектаров пастбищ, из них 100 миллионов это пустыни, полупустынные зоны. Из них где-то около 70 миллионов – это песчаная зона. Я как раз считаю, что это именно значит, относится к экологической зоне значит, Казахстана. Но вы изучали значит, в Казахстане этой зоны или нет? Или вы сейчас планируете провести какие-то исследования по этому направлению? Поскольку значит, это связано и 
значит, растительностью и связано с отдельными видами сельскохозяйственных животных для разведения. Слышно было вам? Uh, I believe I did. Uh, the fundamental question was, is, uh, is our research or our program going to continue in more of the sandy soil areas in uh, the country of Kazakhstan? And at this point, uh, the answer is, I guess, provisional. Uh, we are focused on the Akmola Oblast uh, because that's where the Ministry of Agriculture asked us to uh, concentrate our work to test out these concepts. In earlier trips, we were down by uh, Almaty and we did do some of original uh, survey work down there. And the techniques for showing do work. But all of our effort right now is in Akmola in the upper grassland areas uh, in the steppe region. Yeah, I think that... Но я считаю, что это неправильная постановка вопроса, поскольку у нас песчаные, эта песчаная зона находится в Жамбылской и в Туркестанской областях. Там более песчаная зона. Вот там необходимо было провести совместное исследование учеными Казахстана. Тогда они более широко получили бы ответы на те вопросы, которые нас сегодня говорят. Originally, when we got started on this back in uh, 2018, there was a thought then of doing three of the obelisks in the upper northern parts of Kazakhstan in the grassland steppe areas first, and then expanding then to other areas of the entire country in a systematic matter. So we were going to start in the in the north and work our way down towards the south. Uh, as the project developed, then they decided to uh, have us just focus on Akmola right now. Uh, at the end of this project, uh, when we come back to Kazakhstan in November, assuming we're allowed to travel because of COVID, uh, then there will be discussions on do they want us to uh, continue this work with our partners in Kazakhstan and expand to the other areas as he's described. Uh, I don't have an answer right now, uh, but our team is more than willing to continue working over there in Kazakhstan uh, with everybody. We've had a very pleasant and rewarding experience and we'd you know, like the opportunity to work in more sandy, deserty areas. All right, we'll go ahead and get, uh, go ahead. Yes. Вопрос. Можно, да? Да, это Масей, Бейбит Масеевич, Закатуйми Джангерхан, Уральс. Вот в этом слайде, который здесь показан на экране, это вот фактическое состояние по обычному воде Акмолинской области. Пять стадий дегрессии или деградации. Это все мы это знаем. А вот здесь вопрос стоит, восстановление по обычному воде. Наши американские коллеги, что может предложить? Потому что вот эти вопросы изучения мониторинга, есть методика, мы все это знаем. То, что вот описывали, значит, почвенный, это, мониторинг почвенных это, покровов, растительных покровов. А что можете предложить по восстановлению по избичному воде? Вот это интересно для нас. Или это вопрос вы не изучали? Спасибо.
The most likely way forward for restoration, uh, I can provide some additional uh, background information uh, to Gulnaz uh, to put forward for you guys. These grasslands in Akmola are very similar to the grasslands that we have in North America, uh, in our state of North Dakota, and then into Canada. They have the exact same species uh, dominated by stipas, dominated by festucas. Uh, we have Collaria cristatum. Uh, that's a similar plant that you have. Uh, we have worked out, at least in the United States, uh, plant materials that are available then in seed to reseed areas uh, that have been degraded. There are herbicides that we have utilized in the United States that will take out the artemisias, th these wood species, uh, to reduce the competition, to allow the seeding to uh, take and establish. Fire is an important uh, resource and prescribed fire in certain circumstances if you have enough vegetation to carry a fire, can remove undesirable plants and allow natural regeneration if you have the seed source. So there's a whole series of restoration technologies. Uh, I'll make sure to incorporate that in uh, the fourth presentation when we're talking about uh, stocking rates and how to calculate that. Uh, today, I was just going through all the processes to get us up to the points we understand exactly what the concerns are. And then next week, we'll talk about scaling up from site measurements to regional measurements using remote sensing. In the fourth presentation, we'll talk about calculating stocking rates. And I will then modify my presentation then to talk about restoration activities or revegetation and what we use in the United States. I believe it'll transition over to your area because of the commonalities in climate, soils, and vegetation, but some tests would have to be done to make sure that there is a translation. All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started then again, and we'll go forward. So the plant community states and transition models, we've gone through this slide. So as I talked about earlier, we're gonna go through these earlier. We start with uh, phase one, which is our idealized plant community. And it is a stipa based community with other perennial grasses, uh, festuca, and a minor component is our shrubs. We can move into then what I call phase three, this where you have a shift in species from festuca to stipa, armesia, the wormwood is still a minor component. These are some slides we took on our uh, work that we did in 2019. Uh, one of the things that we do is we actually do a site inventory. And so we document then the prevalence of grasses so we can understand then what is dominant, what is subdominant. And also this allows us to identify invasive plants and whether those plants then are poisonous to livestock or, or just invasive and not palatable. Uh, we get into now uh, phase four, uh, that is the degraded site. And you start to see on the left-hand side then a change in species dominance, the Artemisia is in class five, which is the highest uh, density count that we do uh, with Festuca. And your Stipa is dropping in dominance. As we continue on, then you see that Artemisia now is totally dominating the site in class five. Uh, the Festuca uh, is down to one. We've lost our uh, stipas out of this plant community. So, and then you end up in this decadent stage, which is uh, 
not been grazed recently in the last three or four years. You can tell that by the amount of litter on the soil surface, the amount of dead standing material. Uh, and it is being dominated in this case, co-dominated by Festuca and the Stipa. So we want to identify all the plants on the site. Uh, what we typically saw was that degradation was most prevalent uh, near water sources. So the closer you get to water, usually you have more disturbance. Uh, and that's something then that can be handled with management on how you access the water. Uh, in the bottom picture, there's a freestanding uh, water. Uh, and so how you approach that water, you just have open access and allow them to walk right into the water and drink. Or do you fence the water and have a controlled watering point, or maybe you've even put down a concrete pad so that they enter the water so that you don't puddle up the water, uh, stir it all up. It uh, minimizes then the opportunities for the livestock to either defecate or urinate in the water, which can cause water quality problems. So water distribution becomes a central point then of management. Estimating plant community characteristics. So we go through a field data collection. I'll go through this fairly quickly. Uh, we use a GPS to locate our plot so we can go back. We want to make sure we understand the slope shape, slope length, the percent slope, the aspect. We take photos of the site. We sample our soil. We measure the plant height. And we use a line point intercept techniques for getting foliar and basal cover. Uh, we will then clip and we'll look at the total standing biomass. We take photos before we clip and after we clip the plot. We do a complete plant census, uh, get a species list of what's out there for abundance. We will ask the ranch, if possible, a series of questions like what is their grazing management? Do they use continuous grazing during the grazing season? Do they use some sort of rotational grazing? Do they use a time management grazing system where you might graze it like for seven days or 10 days and move through it systematically? Uh, where is the water located? Uh, what is the quality of water? Uh, its temperature, its salinity. Uh, so just real quickly then, uh, what we utilize when we go to the field in the left-hand side, there's a sharpshooter, a specific type of uh, shovel we find very useful for digging through the soil. Uh, and you can see the other type of uh, instruments that you should be familiar with most of them, I believe. Clippers, tape measures, uh, sieves for our soils. Estimating standing biomass. So with remote sensing, uh, we can utilize uh, that to get seasonal and total estimates of biomass. Our field-based techniques then get us just that one day that we're there. And we can then try and correlate that to a satellite overpass. When we have validated uh, that our remote sensing imagery is calibrated correctly, then we can expand that then across the grazing season to end up what we call annual net primary productivity of above ground standing biomass. And it's that annual total biomass uh, that we utilize as a starting point then for calculating stocking rates. And biomass in this area most often is highly related to forage. That is the plant materials that the livestock eat, but not all biomass is forage. And forage will change based on the type of livestock. Sheep will eat a different type of biomass than cattle, and the same thing with horses, goats, and camels. So that's why we collect the species inventory, so we know what plants are out there. Are they poisonous? Are they not poisonous? Are they uh, highly palatable to beef cattle? Uh, one of the things is if you have dairy cattle that are grazing and you have mustards, that mustard, the oils in the mustards can get actually into the milk and give the milk an off flavor, taste, and you get lower sale price. 
So those are some of the things that we're looking for when we're doing all of this. So fully cover and ground cover to determine the risk of soil erosion and health. We use a line point intercept technique to do that. So there are a series of handbooks then and documents that we have made available. Uh, Golnez has those. Monitoring manual uh, has all of the detailed techniques. That has been summarized then into two different programs. The Bureau of Land Management designed a program called Assessment, Inventory, and Monitoring Strategy. Uh, and then the Natural Resources Conservation Service has their monitoring program, and they call that NRI for National Resources Inventory. All three of these handbooks uh, are in your reference material. So we start with the concept of a mac macro plot. Uh, we designed ours. It's 100 meters long by 100 meter in a T formation. We use a fixed compass orientation uh, so that we can always refine the site and resample it if necessary. That means the macro plot then is about seven tenths of a hectare. So this just shows some of the measurements we take across the transects uh, and we'll start going through them now systematically. So I've got another video here. Uh, I will run it real quickly. Describe now is establishing transects. The transect is a line on the ground along which sample points are established for collecting vegetation and soil data. The first step to establishing transects is to find the zero point. In this case, 330 degrees out from the center of the plot. Michelle will walk out to the starting point. After she reaches the start of the transect, she'll roll the tape back up. She's going to plant the zero end of the transect at the start and start walking out in the direction that I tell her while I'm keeping the sight on her direction. She's staying to the right of the transect and left arm outstretched so, so that she doesn't walk on the transect itself. Michelle reaches the end of the transect. She'll turn around, face me, and I'll direct her in the correct orientation. Pulling the tape as tightly as you can, at the same time sticking it firmly to the ground. Looks good. After finishing setting the end of the transect, Michelle will come back to the center of the plots, staying well to the right of the transect. makes pulling transects difficult, we have another method for pulling out transects. I'm sending Michelle to the start of this transect again, lining her up with the compass. Put the stick in the ground, roll up the tape. She's going to pace out to the end of the transect, the approximate number of paces it'll take to get there, staying well right of the transect while she does so. As Michelle presses the end of the line, I'll line her up. And it looks good. Michelle will place the tape on the ground, stake it to the ground through the handle with the real side up, and then attach the, tip, the end of the tape to the PVC pipe using a ring clip. And she'll proceed walking towards the zero end of the transect 
with my guidance. As Michelle approaches the mesquite shrub, she's going to keep the PVC pipe low to the ground, keeping it underneath any of the woody vegetation, at the same time avoiding any litter or digging up any soil. And she's going to walk around the shrub and pull the pipe through from the other side. The whole time, I'm keeping her in line with the direction of the transect. Michelle's going to make her way down to the zero end of the transect using the pin as the guide. Unhook the tape from the PVC pipe and then attach the tape to the ground with the stake. And she's going to walk back out to the end of the transect, staying well to the right of the transect and tension the tape. When Michelle reaches the end of the line, she's going to pull the stake out. Pull the tape tight, keeping it low to the ground, locking the handle down, and restaking it to the ground. So after you get your tape stretched out, then uh, I understand from my colleague Jason that the, the bandwidth issue, the videos are slightly choppy. All of these videos are in the supplemental materials, and it shows you how to download them and uh, play them on their YouTube videos. So hopefully they'll be uh, more useful that way for you. Uh, I apologize that the bandwidth makes them slightly choppy. Uh, so we do a plant census. We divide the transects into four quadrats. Uh, and then we walk around that entire quadrat, identifying every plant species uh, that we can. And we put them into different classes or abundance ratings, as you can see on the left-hand side. Estimating forage. And as I mentioned earlier, that's going to vary by livestock species. So uh, in the upper picture, you can see good forage availability. We see poor forage ability in the lower slide. Uh, Non-forage must be determined for each species of livestock. If a mixed herd of animals is grazing, let's say, and we have seen this, where we might have horses, sheep, and cattle all in the same pasture, all at the same time, uh, then we will have to make one type of calculation for forage uh, and adjust it then for each livestock species. If you're only gra grazing a single animal, like only beef cattle, then forage calculations are much simpler. So here's the data form then for plant census. The data forms and uh, the instructional guides on how to do our sampling technique are in the reference material also. Uh, this is an example of uh, one of the sites we are on. We have listed all the species on the left-hand side and then the frequency on the right-hand side. And we give it a life form class, whether it's a grass, a forb, a shrub, a tree, uh, cactus or other succulents shrub uh also then because we were in areas that had saline seeps uh, we had rushes and cattails we and sedges that were really not edible to uh the beef cattle so we would pull those out as a different life form class also so estimating foliar and ground cover down that line transect that tape that we have pulled Every two meters, we stop, lower a pin directly down to the soil surface through the canopy, and we record the first canopy hit, if you hit any plant, uh, by species, uh, if possible, to identify them. If not, then by life form class. So we would lower the pin down. We might hit a grass. We would call that the stipa uh, and identify the species. Then you continue all the way to the soil surface and where that pin hits the soil surface then there are different types of ground cover that we break it into. Uh, is it bare soil? 
Is it litter, that organic material that is recognizable on the soil surface? Is it a rock? Is it the plant basal area? Or is it a cryptogamic crust or a biological soil crust? We use the line point intercept then to end up with a, a second way then of looking at species abundance. Uh, we can analyze that. There are 100 points uh, on each tape. Uh, that gives us 200 observations then uh, to look at frequency of plants uh, by cover class. And this becomes important then when we get into estimating soil erosion. And the same thing then for the ground cover on the soil surface. Those are two very critical measurements we make for looking at soil erosion and also runoff potential and maybe recharge rates into uh, lakes or stock ponds that might be used for watering. I'm gonna skip the, uh, this video right now because uh, I understand the bandwidth is, is not there and it's kind of choppy. Again, these videos are available in the reference materials, so I encourage you to look at them afterwards. There's actually a total of 10 videos uh, that you can download and look at. So real quickly then, uh, our life form classes are trees, shrubs, cacti, grass, forbs, agaves, different types of grass cover types, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that first hit, anything on the plant above the soil surface uh, is considered a foliar hit. So whether you hit the leaf or the sheath or the stem uh, or a seed head, we just all call it a foliar cover. And then we go right to the soil surface. So the basal area of the plant is defined as where those uh, stems are immediately emerging from the soil surface. Uh, we have different type of grasses. We try and break them into from life form classes. We found that to be very critical in understanding hydrology of the site. So your large bunch grasses uh, have a different root structure than your sod grasses uh, in the second photo. And then your annual grasses uh, have very little biomass uh, in a lot of cases and don't offer a lot of uh, forage or protection from wind and water erosion. So we break them out into three types of grasses. Uh, here is a uh, indication then of the ground cover types. We have bare soil, we have rock. Rock we define as greater than two millimeters by USDA standards. We have the basal area of the plant and we have litter. And litter would also include uh, animal feces on the soil surface. So we also have a uh, biological soil crust. When we were over there, we did see some uh, biological soil crust in Akmola. These were mosses uh, and here in the desert Southwest of the United States. And I would think it might also be uh, common in Kazakhstan, biological site uh, crusts on the site are indication that the site is relatively stable. Uh, they are not very tolerant to livestock grazing and the compaction and hoof action then disturbs them and they will disappear fairly fast in opening the site up to both wind and water erosion. So we have a, a guide then on how to uh, do line point intercept. Uh, it comes with a uh, second page then that describes how to lay out the transect, where to actually take your measurements of uh, standing biomass. Uh, this is our form we utilize for calculating uh, the cover value. So the first hit through the canopy, we take a second hit as it goes through the canopy, if it occurs, uh, and it's a different species and then we record the ground. Uh, this data sheet was specifically developed then for a uh, REM model, that's the rangeland hydrology and erosion model. And all of the different uh, tabs you can see on the bottom then are the different data sheets that we have developed then for these techniques. 
uh, and they're all available in the supplemental material. This happens to be an Excel program uh, that we utilize. So we clip five different plots. Uh, the size of the plot will vary based on the vegetation. The more homogeneous and uniform the vegetation is, we can go to a smaller plot. Uh, if you have very uh, discrete plant communities like we might find in desert regions, we're gonna use a much larger plot uh, so that we get that variation in defined. We have defined areas on the transects that we take uh, so that they are repeated. And that way, if we go back out to the site for a second evaluation, let's say a year later or two years later, we know where we clip the first year so that we're not getting an influence of that in our second year sampling. In the second year, we would move the location of the uh, areas we clip. We also defined the areas to clip then based on satellite imagery. The transect we use is 100 meters long by 100 meters. A Landsat pixel is basically 30 meters on a leg, 30 meters by 30 meters. You can put within this circle area then nine Landsat satellite images. That gives us enough sample numbers from the uh, remote sensing by averaging those nine pixels. These five different transect points that we clip on are located in five of the nine pixels. So we have a better chance of correlating our ground sample to the satellite imagery. Now satellite imagery has its challenges in that if it's very foggy or cloudy, or if there's a fire or a lot of dust in the air from a previous dust storm, then the remote sensing image may not be clear. Uh, and that's just a risk we take with remote sensing imagery. Uh, with Landsat, which comes over about every 16 days. There are other satellites like MODIS that come over basically on a daily time period. Different resolution, uh, they're about 250 meters on a leg, uh, but by mixing and matching different remote sensing satellite imagery, we can come pretty close to overlapping the day that we actually sample to try our correlation. Then for expanding this limited information we're collecting to the entire pasture, of interest. Estimating style standing biomass. When we were in Akmola, we felt that a quarter meter squared hoop was adequate for describing the vegetation because it was fairly uniform. As we got in areas that were more open, uh, then we went to a meter square plot. We do write down the plot size on our data forms, and that's necessary then to expand the information as we clip it in grams and weigh it on site uh, per meter squared. Then we multiply by 40 to get kilograms per hectare. So we take that photo, as I said before, and after we clip, so we have a reference of that uh, when we're going through the data, if something doesn't seem right, we can go back to the photos. Uh, I have clipped out. You can see in the upper photo, there's a blue line. That is a whiteboard where we have written the transect and the site ID. Uh, I just clipped it out of here because I didn't want to show the ranch we were working on. That allows us then to uh, go back through the data at a later point in time and try and verify if somehow we typed in the number wrong. So again, we have, uh, yes. Sorry, this is Gulnas. We have a few questions in the chart. So uh, okay. we'll refer them before you go to the next question. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and ask questions. Gulnara Yunusova задает, что имелось в виду под оценкой водного потенциала почв? По каким параметрам она проводится? Okay, there, there's 
two parts to that is what I heard. So I'll repeat. So one was water holding capacity of the soil. And how do we measure that? The second one is depth to water table. So I'll answer the first one. Uh, soil texture is a very common way then of inferring through what we call pedotransfer functions, the water holding capacity of the soil. So the sandier the soil, the easier the water infiltrates into it, but it has limited capacity then for holding the water in the pores in the soil. The clayer the soil is, the more clay, the finer material, uh, it slows down infiltration into the soil, but it holds onto the water very tight. Your loam soil, which is a mixture of sand, silts, and clays, has kind of the ideal infiltration rate, the amount of water to enter the soil, and the ease with which the plants can remove the water from the soil and use it. There is, uh, and I can provide this uh, in supplemental uh, material, some very quick uh, ways of measuring soil water holding capacity. Uh, there's uh, pressure plates that we can utilize. So we take our soil out of the soil pit by horizon we sieve it through a two millimeter sieve. We pack it in a small uh, ring. It's put on a ceramic plate. And then under, we irrigate the plate so that the water comes up through the bottom of the plate, uh, saturates the soil. It is in a pressure chamber. Uh, then at different atmospheric pressures, <clears throat> we measure the amount of water that is withheld in the soil. So you might put in uh, nine soil rings. We would run it at, let's say one third bar. Uh, that's an old US way of doing it. Uh, pull three of them and measure the amount of water that's retained. Then you might do one bar and five bar and 15 bar and you get a water release curve or a water holding curve. Well, that's an older style of doing it uh, in its laboratory. There are meters available right now. Uh, one is time domain reflectometry based technology where you actually can buy it. You then stick the probe right in the soil surface and it'll give you a relative uh, water content of the soil right on the site. Uh, that doesn't tell you the water holding capacity uh, per se, uh, unless you saturate the site and then let it free drain uh, and come back like 24 hours later. And there are other techniques then for measuring uh, water availability. Uh, one is just drying the soil. Uh, we will take a small soil sample, put it in a tin can, uh, seal the tin can uh, with the lid. We use uh, tape, tape that lid so it's airtight. Uh, we'll go back to the lab, weigh it, wet, then we put it in the oven at 110 degrees centigrade for 48 hours, uh, drive off all the water, re-weigh it, and then through uh, manipulation of dry weight versus wet weight in a division, you can calculate what was the water content at the day you sampled. Again, you can do that in the field where you can saturate the plot. Uh, come back 24 to 48 hours to let it free drain. So that you're at what we would call field capacity, then sample that soil and go through a laboratory process. I did provide to uh, Ilnaz uh, and Cosmo uh, a series of handbooks. Uh, they are the official uh, reference manuals then on how to do soil sampling. So uh, hopefully she's gotten them out of customs now and they at least are in uh, El Mahdi with her. And uh, all of these techniques are documented in these uh, reference manuals. Now, as far as depth to water table, uh, in most rangelands uh, that I have worked in, 
that's really not an issue of concern because it's far deeper than the uh, roots of the plants that we're dealing with, especially in grasslands. Uh, grassland roots probably will not extend beyond one meter in depth. And so uh, you can use an auger, uh, as was described earlier, to auger down uh, to at least one meter and then determine if there is a uh, near surface groundwater. The other way we look at groundwater then is in most of the United States, we have access to uh, good soils maps and geologic maps and water maps where the depth of the water table has been defined uh, for us. But like I said, in most rangeland situations, uh, we're in arid and semi-arid regions and shallow groundwater is rare. Uh, hopefully I answered the question. Uh, yes, please. Вопрос. Вот по вашей методике, вот, например, площадь пастбища тысячи гектаров. Сколько трансектов надо закладывать? Определенно существует, да, например, как бы ну, граница, например, на 100 метров один трансек, на 100 гектаров. Вот, по вашей методике, как, как это делается? Olga, could you translate into English for me? Uh, Uh, that's an absolute excellent question. Uh, there are a couple of ways that we would do it here in the United States. So we do have a program, and it may not be available in Kazakhstan, where uh, both on the Bureau of Land Management and the, and the NRCS on lands that they work on have an aerial flight, aerial photography program that flies over uh, at certain frequencies. And so we have access to high resolution uh, color uh, aerial photography that we will look at. Let's say we have an area that's a, a, a thousand hectares, quite a large area. Uh, we'll then get those photographs, lay them out, uh, and uh, stitch what we call stitch them all together so they're a, a continuous uh, image. And we'll scan through them then to see if there are any obvious differences in the plant community uh, that we need to note. The other way of doing that then is using remote sensing imagery. Uh, the Landsat imagery uh, from the United States government is free for downloading uh, if you have the right tools to download it and analyze it. And that's another good way then on these large areas then of looking for homogeneity or uh, discontinuities uh, in your plant communities. Uh, you need to sample uh, representative areas. So we have a concept called uh, key area. And so if we have a thousand hectares, we will have looked at our remote sensing imagery and uh, our uh, aerial photography, mapped out areas we think are homogeneous, and then we'll go and sample in the center area of that uh, so that we, uh, and then hopefully uh, that gives us an area then of uh, scaling up our answer. And a lot of that conversation is gonna happen uh, next week when Dr. G talks about scaling up. It's exactly to address that question.
Are there any other questions before I go on? All right. So again, we have another uh, guide uh, uh, on how to collect the grasses uh, and the biomass uh, by our clipping. And it's available in the reference material. So we measure the plant height uh, at fixed intervals uh, using a uh, really defined technique. So we don't pull the plant out or anything else. Uh, we measure it as it is in the field in a 30 centimeter uh, reference area around a specific point on the transect. And it is defined up here in the guides. And one of the reasons we want to look at plant height is it's a good way of quickly assessing is the area been heavily grazed or not grazed. Uh, it's also useful then in predicting wind erosion. The higher the plant is, it gives you more uh, structural uh, influence then that will reduce uh, wind erosion. So again, we have a, a data sheet for that. So soil sampling, as I'd mentioned earlier, we dig a pit down to 50 centimeters. We take a picture of the profile. Uh, zero is at the top, and then the bottom would be at 50 centimeters. Uh, and we go through then and we mark our horizons. Uh, typically, I will use a golf tee, uh, a nice color golf tee, and I'll put it in at the horizon breaks uh, right next to my tape measure. So then when I take a photo, uh, I have a reference then of the different uh, horizons. And with a large tape measure then, uh, we measure the depth of each of those horizons. We then pull, for, as you saw in the one video, a surface soil. Uh, in this case, it's got a lot of vegetation on it. So we would clip all that vegetation off. We would then sieve it through a two millimeter sieve to only try and get the soil. And then we would use the texture by feel technique uh, to try and estimate that texture. In the US, we have 12 texture uh, classes. And we use this ribboning technique, what we call texture by feel. And there are a series of uh, guides then that work you through a flow chart so you can estimate the texture. Uh, obviously, this can be done in the laboratory. Uh, but that's additional cost and time. We also measure the surface soil color uh, and we measure the organic matter. Now the, the soil color, there's a color book. And again, I've provided that to uh, Golnaz uh, there as a reference. Uh, and that's very important in remote sensing then uh, to get the color of the soil. Uh, so you can try and understand then that background color that will influence your prediction of uh, standing biomass. And we'll try and get organic matter a uh, contact. Now that's only a laboratory technique, uh, again, because that will influence the color and it also tells us the productivity of the site. The more organic matter, the more productive it is, the more degraded the site, the less organic matter we will have in it. Uh, real quickly, soil texture. Uh, the books on the left are again on your, in your reference materials. Uh, the picture on the right, the triangle is a soil textural triangle as we use it in the United States. Uh, this is just a real quick uh, guide showing you then how to do texture by feel. Uh, here in the United States, uh, we actually have, uh, are in the process of developing a soil test kit where all 12 soil textures will be in little glass jars and then when we go out to the field, then we can give these to the students and they can practice so they can uh, determine what is a real clay uh, from measured samples and compare that maybe then to a clay loam or to a loam. As you see here in the center, the different ribbons, uh, how you can push that soil out, the more of the clay, the stronger the cohesion, and you can get a nice long ribbon. As you saw in the video, in a real sandy soil, there's no cohesion. Uh, 
and that's how we define it as a sand. The other things we, we measure on site then, and these go towards our erosion calculations and our water runoff, is we need to look at the slope, uh, and we record that in percent slope, or the shape. And we use four uh, generalized shape as illustrated here. So the typical Kazakh ranch in Akmo Oblast. So what we have found to date is it's typically grazed from April or May, depending upon the weather, and then May end in October. Then there's winter confinement uh, from October to December. Uh, typically, we have seen that herders are used uh, to move the livestock around. We did not see a lot of areas that were fenced in paddocks where the cows were turned out by themselves and then collected later. Uh, and with this type of herder uh, accessing free water sources, there is a option then of trailing. If you're going back and forth over the same area too often that cause these paths, then that can become erosion areas. And they also are uh, conduct areas for uh, invasive plants then for coming in. Uh, we did not see supplemental feed during the growing season. Uh, and rarely did we see the use of salts or mineral blocks to help distribute the livestock and to provide uh, critical uh, nutrients. So we also saw uh, very common that there were mixed herds uh, of both cattle, sheep, and horses grazing the same area at the same time. Uh, this can increase a risk of degradation uh, on the way to the water sources. Uh, animals are herded. As we mentioned, uh, this helps prevent theft, uh, can keep them out of cropland, and then it can help move the animals to and from water in a timely manner. Opportunities, uh, as I mentioned earlier, right here in the center, there's a planting guide from the Intermountain region of the United States. Uh, a lot of those species uh, should be adapted to your area. In fact, uh, my colleagues there in Logan, Utah, have been in Kazakhstan uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago. And then in association with colleagues there, they collected plant materials. They have brought those over to here to the United States. They have grown those out. And some of those have become foundation plants that we use in our revegetation approach. The planting guide not only talks about the species, but actually how to do it, uh, what seeding rates would be, instruments uh, to do that, like a rangeland drill, uh, where you actually put it into the soil, when is broadcast seeding, where you spread it across appropriate, uh, do you need to use herbicides to uh, get rid of undesirable plants? Uh, and so a lot of that is documented in the Intermountain Guides. Uh, we can also use uh, unmanned aerial vehicles then uh, to map that thousand hectares, uh, flying a UAV over it, processing the images. Then if you don't have access to satellite data or uh, photogrammetry, uh, is another way then of looking for uniformity or discontinuities in your area uh, to determine stocking rates. Uh, again, these are the references, as I mentioned up there in the right-hand side, grasses of the Northern Plains, uh, volume ones and twos, uh, where you have warmer seasons uh, species and where you have cool season species. Uh, we also have uh, documentation then on different types of uh, hardware that can be used. The one on the lower right-hand side is a loss in aerator. We use that pulling behind a tractor uh, to break up uh, undesirable shrubs. It crushes them, uh, lays them on the soil surface. So we get uh, a seed bed preparation. And then in the center, that little uh, square is a dribble seeder. Uh, so we're spreading a seed it gets rolled in by the back uh, roller uh, and compressed into the soil. And for certain plant communities, uh, we've had increases in forage production of up to 400% uh, after the treating this way. 
uh, then training is always an option uh, uh, that we can work on into the future. And again, this monitoring manual is available in your supplemental resources. It goes through every the tech, all the techniques we've talked about today in detail. And that concludes my presentation today. We have about 15 minutes then for open questions and I'll try and uh, answer as many as I can. And thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, Давайте я отвечу, да, здесь. Здравствуйте всем, меня зовут Гульна Сыскакова. Если вы регистрировались на курс через ссылку, то я вам через свою личную почту присылала именно ссылку по, на Zoom, это Zoom наше обучение. Как только у нас завершатся семинары, вы получите, мы на сайте Казахского национального аграрного университета, мы опубликуем все наши семинары, все наши, например, презентации, которые есть на русском, на английском языках, и также вот дополнительные материалы, из которых говорит Марк. Все они будут разделены по дням семинара, и вы их сможете получить после завершения всех пяти семинаров. Рахмет. Рахмет. Спасибо. Рахмет. А можно еще один вопрос а ему задать? Да, да, задавайте. Yes, please, go ahead. А вот он исследовал, были исследования за соленой почвы? In the United States, I just completed a six-year project uh, in the states of Colorado, Utah, <clears throat> uh, and New Mexico, in what we call the Upper Colorado River Basin. They, those soils out there are marine-derived sh shales. They are highly saline, highly sodic, and our rainfall runoff erosion model has been adapted uh, with new algorithms to deal with infiltration rates, runoff rates, and erosion rates for saline sodic soils. Uh, so we've got extensive experience here in the United States in those areas. Uh, our laboratory in Logan, Utah, uh, does have a whole series of plant materials that are designed for uh, revegetating saline sodic soils. Uh, I have to tell you that is one of the most difficult areas that I've ever worked in in my life for revegetating on saline sodic soils. Uh, so we have extensive experience on that and we could, you know, talk about that, uh, our experiences. We have not uh, done extensive work in Kazakhstan on saline sodic soils. I know they exist there, we have seen it, uh, but so far our, our sampling areas uh, just by the nature of Akmola Oblis did not have extensive saline sodic soils in it that we encountered. Was that helpful? У меня один вопрос. Это Умбаев Абдрахман, профессор Казнау. Ну, прежде всего, я выражаю искреннюю благодарность Марку за прекрасную презентацию. Это позже вопрос, это серьезный вопрос для Казахстана. У меня вопрос такой. С какими научными центрами и какими учеными значит, проводит исследования господин Марк? 
Well, right, <clears throat> excuse me, right now we've been limited uh, to working extensively with COSNOW. Uh, that's just how the project got set up with the Ministry of Agriculture defining uh, COSNOW University as our chief uh, in-country support organization. Uh, I realize there are many other agricultural universities and universities that uh, work in natural resources. And we have, uh, would like to look for opportunities to collaborate. Uh, COSNOW has been a phenomenal partner. Uh, and I would hope that all the other universities would be just as welcoming and as helpful. Я думаю, что правильное решение принято. Казнау – это значит, главный научный центр и учебный центр нашей республики, поэтому мы, я там работаю, мы совместно будем вести работу. Ну, можно, да, еще один вопрос? А, uh, yes, go ahead. Да, это, да, на Сеев, в Суральске опять. Вот знаете, вот такие аналогичные работы мы проводили, также изучали почвенные ресурсы, растительный покров. У нас в Казахстане существует специальный приказ Министерства сельского хозяйства, когда определяем степень деградации, учитывается снижение запаса гумуса и плотность, объемный вес почвы. Вот в ваших исследованиях вы учитываете эти моменты? Почему-то вы не говорили о химических, химическом составе почвы. Как они, значит, были изменены в Акмулинской области? Или просто у вас целью вашей работы было просто изучение профиля почвенного и растительного покрова? Почему-то вы не затрагиваете химический состав почвы? Спасибо. Uh, no, you are correct. Uh... The original agreement uh, with Asian Development Bank and the Ministry of Agriculture and our team uh, was really to focus on above ground biomass uh, or more specifically forage resources uh, that were available then to support the livestock industry. Uh, we have not measured the soil chemistry uh, in any way other than trying to get uh, organic matter and soil color. Uh, and those are only uh, indirect measurements of soil chemistry. А вот, извините, в Америке тогда вы, вот, по вашей методике тоже вы не предусматриваете, да, изучение химсостава, вот гумус как влияет, потому что у нас в Казахстане обязательно снижение гумуса как повлияло, плотность почвы влияет, выпас обязательно влияет на плотность почвы. Ваших, в Америке вы эти индикаторы не учитываете, да? Indirectly we do. We are fortunate in the United States that probably 95% of our soils have been mapped uh, both phys for physical characteristics and chemical Uh, characteristics by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, that is their mandate. Uh, and then the, they produce soil surveys, uh, which is a geographic area. And that information then is available on the web to what they call the web soil survey. Uh, so you can dial in on the web. Uh, with a mouse, you can then identify the specific area and it'll pull up the soil uh, series information. Uh, And it'll give you uh, chemistry, uh, nutrient content, uh, salinity content, uh, depth of the horizons, uh, and all that information. So in the video, that's why Jeff was talking about our, our approach is we go out to the site. We have done, we've brought our soil maps with us. And then in the area that we want to sample for vegetation, for forage, for livestock, we will dig one pit at a minimum. Uh, we may end up digging four or five if there's a lot of diversity out there. And then through digging that pit and visual observations in the field, we will correlate that to the soil series. And from that, then we can get information on chemical composition uh, of the soil. And so we don't directly measure it ourselves. We're capable of that. 
We have a, a excellent soil uh, laboratory here in Reno, uh, but the costs are so prohibitive that we use this correlation method to previously define chemi chemical and physical attributes of the soil. Также в чате задали вопрос, я зачитаю для Марка. Вопрос звучит таким образом. От Асхата Наушабаева. Учитывается ли неоднородность состава или свойств почвы при оценке деградации пастбищ? I'm not sure I really understand the question, but I will try. Uh, most of all of our techniques are based off relative difference from the idealized plant community soil ecosystem uh, that has co-evolved. So we will go and find a reference area or the best possible area that we can for what we think should exist on the site. You dig a pit there for the soils and you look at your horizons uh, and, and the soil properties that we can see with our eyes and test with our fingers. You then compare that to the site of interest that you're studying. Uh, and so, yes, we look at inconsistencies like uh, in last week's presentation, I showed a slide uh, again from our desert southwest, where in one pit, uh, only of about a meter in width, you saw where the wind erosion had scoured the soil surface, removed that A horizon. R and then in the shrub, that sand and that surface soil was buried and trapped. And so when you dig your soil pit, you look at where is what we call the A horizon, that first soil horizon. It was missing on the left. On the right, it was buried under maybe 20 or 30 centimeters of sand that had blown up over the top. So we're looking at how consistent uh, the soil is. At the same time, we're looking at the inconsistency. Is something missing? In this case, we were missing the A horizon. It was inconsistent from our reference. And then right next to it, we found it was buried under the soil that had eroded. Again, that's inconsistent with the reference. So in both cases, it indicates degradation. Hopefully I understood the question and answered it uh, satisfactory. Также здесь есть еще второй вопрос от Асхата Нашабаева. Считается ли деградированным пастбище, если доля непоедаемых растений очень высокая? Well, again, I'll go back to the concept that we utilize for degradation. So we have a reference area. We have measured the plant distribution as far as abundance, how many there are, what the biomass by those individual plant types are, uh, the frequency of occurrence. So we have that as a reference. Now, if we go to the site of interest that we've been asked to look at, we measure the deviation away from that reference area. So if we have changed species and now in the, degre in, 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 the new, in the new area, we see a total different assemblage of plants. And those plants often can be unpalatable. That's why they have survived. That is a clear indication of degradation. Now, one point to make. There are areas of natural plant communities 
that could be our reference area, that a lot of the plants are not palatable and uh, they're not forage. In our desert regions, we have a plant called creosote. Uh, it's a shrub and uh, really no an a livestock animal will eat it, but it's naturally occurring. And so just being uh, unpalatable by itself doesn't mean the site is degraded if that plant should be in the site. Hopefully uh, my answer was clear. Mark, Можно вопрос, it? да? Yeah. Oh. Just a minute. Uh, yes, maybe. go ahead. Yeah. I just would like to, uh, first of all, would like to say a big thanks for this very uh, interesting presentation and clarif clarification about the assessment and monitoring the uh, rangeland land. And the most of the researchers from the our university very interested because we are actually uh, done a similar project related to the assessment of the rangeland and pasture land. And uh, when you will hopefully will come at November, it will be very uh, inter will, will be very great if you will meet this researcher who are actually working in the similar uh, work. And uh, that uh, last uh, questions, two questions from the uh, Ashat. Uh, he actually also the soil scientist and he got there from this year new grant related to the assessment of the rangeland land in the desert uh, areas and it will be very interesting to you to know him you know, well because it's uh, uh, he also working in the real like related uh, to your topic uh, research and uh, of course, uh, it's very huge work. And uh, as we know, the climate in the world is changing. And even we are working hard to re renew all of this cover. I think it will be very difficult to make something um, productive if we will not work together. Your knowledge in our Kazakhstan researchers knowledge, if we will gather and uh, working together, I think we have some good result in the future. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, our... Разрешите, можно вопрос, да? Yes, go ahead. Вопрос можно, да? А, здравствуйте. Я просто хотел вопрос ради <coughs> понятия вообще пастбища оборотов. В Казахстане применяется на пастбище, так же как и деградирование. Я просто вопрос в Соединенных Штатах Америки. Понятие пастбища оборота применяется на вообще этих угодьях. Спасибо. I'm not familiar with that term here in the United States. Uh, I'm not sure what it what it's referring to. Rotational grazing. Yes, that's Это rotational определенный grazing. временный yeah. интервал времени, на котором выпасается скот. Ротационный пастбище, правильно? Ротационный пастбище, вот принцип того же самовосстановления. Почему? Потому что здесь вопрос у меня тоже второй сразу. Порог способности к самовосстановлению при деградации пастбища, например, в США, какой порог составляет процент? A lot of our research here in the United States has been on uh, over the last 50 years looking at grazing systems. And so uh, there's a variety of grazing systems that have been developed. Uh, rotational grazing uh, is one. Uh, there's a time sequenced grazing. Uh, maybe about 40 years ago, it was known as the savory grazing system. Uh, a term now being used in the, in the northern part of the United States is called mob grazing. Uh, we have a confined uh, number of animals and then you have them in the pasture. 
a very small pasture for a very short time period, maybe three to five days. Then you move them to the next area and the next area and the next area, and you rotate them that way. So there are a variety of techniques that we've used for grazing uh, management, each with pluses and minuses, uh, and they need to be adjusted then for your plant community and your climate. Uh, so as far as natural recovery then, uh, the best way to probably answer that question then is when we do our survey, we are also looking at, as I indicated last week, uh, the reproductive potential of the plants. So have they been so overgrazed that they're not producing seeds uh, anymore? And in that case, then the question is, is if we pulled livestock off and rested it, would the plant be able to uh, grow in the next year and produce uh, seeds? A second way and a very easy way of uh, assessing natural restoration on some of the sites that I showed photos that we uh, sampled, I would consider highly degraded. Uh, the only thing we found on them was really uh, the small artemisia and a very few forbs. We couldn't find any grass at all uh, as far as perennial grasses. There were a few annuals. What I would do is uh, in my assessment and what we do here as a standard practice is we collect uh, surface soil down about two centimeters uh, in numerous areas uh, across the site. We bag those. We then sieve them through a two millimeter sieve. We put that soil then uh, in petri dishes, uh, irrigate it uh, with water, uh, and then put them in growth chambers and see what grows out. And if we don't find any germinated plants of the desired species that we're looking for, it's highly unlikely that rest, just pulling livestock off, will allow for natural recovery in a management time frame that we're interested in because there's no seed source. So you have to introduce the seed source and you have to remove the disturbance, which may be grazing. So that's one of the quick ways that we look at the reproductive potential of the site is by doing what we call a seed bank assessment in combination then with looking at the plants that are there and do they have reproduction potential. We've got time for maybe one or two more questions and then we're at the uh, uh, end of our a lot of time for today and I don't want to keep you any later. Кажется, уже вопросов нету. А, давайте я сделаю еще раз объявление. Все, кто а, участники, ну, вот заходите в Zoom, обязательно смотрите, чтобы у вас было полное имя, фамилия, для а, потом, как бы, чтобы мы вам могли сертификаты выдать. А, также спасибо вам всем, а, что вы активно принимали участие на нашем семинаре. А, след, на следующей неделе у нас а, доктор а, Джиаго Чи будет давать а, по ГИС-системам именно для анализа а, пастбищных угодий. Поэтому а, вы можете по этой же ссылке, которая у вас есть, подключаться уже на следующей неделе. Благодарим. Well, thank you all very much. And I look forward to uh, visiting with you again next week. Uh, same time, uh, same link. And uh, Dr. G is going to be talking about how we scale up from this very uh, minimalistic uh, site information uh, that was mentioned earlier to uh, an entire area of interest. That could be an individual ranch, or it could be an entire obelisk, or it could be the entire country. Uh, the techniques are scalable. And Dr. Chi will walk you through uh, some of the techniques and the approaches we're currently using here. Uh, 
Then in the fourth uh, seminar series, we're going to be talking about calculating stocking rate. Uh, and then uh, in the fifth category, we'll talk about kind of a, uh, a tool called the rangeland hydrology tool that we can use for assessing stability and having a quantitative way of dealing with degradation uh, that's different than measuring plants. It deals with water erosion uh, and runoff, and we can use that runoff information then also then for estimating uh, what is the opportunity to uh, dig a stock tank uh, and capture surface water. Uh, and therefore, uh, that's been one of the issues that have been raised in uh, across Kazakhstan is water availability. So uh, that's our, our lecture series, uh, and hopefully it's useful for you. Uh, and uh, we'll see you all next week. And uh, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Mark.